Hi, I'm Alice K. Recklehouse with Threshold of Hineni, and we are beginning a new series about Passover. Um, I'm really excited about this because Passover is one of my favorite things in the Bible. It's one of my favorite things to celebrate. There is so much in it that informs our Christianity and makes the Bible so much more meaningful to us if we understand Passover, and especially if we've experienced it ourselves. Now, I want to give a little disclaimer. Um, Passover is not something that we are required as Christians to celebrate. Paul and even the church um, in Jerusalem were very, very clear that Gentiles do not need to take on all of the laws and requirements of Judaism, but we are given the option of celebrating it. And the church, in fact, did celebrate Passover for many, many years. And so I really recommend that you celebrate Passover and hopefully all the Jewish festivals at least once in your lifetime, simply because it will help you to understand the Bible a lot better. And it's just really interesting and really fun. <laughs> so I've already done a, a video about Purim. And um, now we're going to talk about Passover. And Passover is a lot more complex. It's a lot more um, important, I guess you would say. And there's a lot more in the Bible about it, both in the Old and New Testaments. So I'm planning for this video series to take seven, maybe eight videos. And um, let me just tell you what I've got planned here. Today, we're going to talk about what the Passover was about, what the backstory is, and uh, when we should celebrate it. Because as Christians, we don't necessarily have to celebrate on the same day that Jews celebrate it. Um, I'll also include below, probably after each of these videos, but definitely today, a list of resources that you might be interested in. Some of them I've written, some of them are by other people. They're resources that I think would be very, very helpful. And then also I'm going to include a list of dates at the bottom because you may not be watching this the same year that I recorded it. So the dates would be different and I don't want to confuse people. So I'll have the dates for when Passover is and when Easter is um, for each of those years. Um, so then the next one, the next video, will be talking about uh, why you might want to celebrate Passover, and we'll get into that a little bit more than what I just talked to you about. Um, another, the next video is going to be talking about leaven and why we have unleavened bread and what I like to call the great leaven hunt and how that can help prepare your heart and your children's hearts for uh, what's going to happen in the Passover Seder. The third, the next, I guess that's four, the next video is going to be about the matzah. That's the unleavened bread. And that's kind of the, um, it's one of the two most important elements in the Passover um, for us as Christians, because this has to do with the Lord's Supper or what we call the Eucharist or communion. And so it's a really important thing. And the insights that you get from how that matzah is handled and what's done with it in the Passover celebration, the Seder, um, will give you a lot more insight and appreciation, I think, for communion. Um, this is the thing specifically that pastors have told me repeatedly has made communion a completely different thing for them and just so much more meaningful. And I would assume that it's made it more meaningful their, for their congregations too, I would hope. Um, okay, so then the other, the next video will be about the first two cups. There are four cups in Passover in the Seder, and they're, each of them is very important. Each of them has a different um, section of the Passover Seder, and so we're going to talk about the first two in one video, and then we'll talk about um, the second two in another video. But between those two, we're going to talk about the Seder plate and the elements, the egg, the bitter herbs, and the other things that are on that plate and what those mean um, to Jews and what they mean to us as Christians. And then after we do that, we're going to talk about the third and fourth cups and um, and that'll be it. So uh, hopefully we can wrap this up in seven or eight videos. Now there is a possibility on the day that I'm recording these, we are waiting to hear from our realtor about our house in Maryland uh, because we're currently negotiating that. And I may have to go kind of like 
in a second here um, <laughs> if he calls. So if that happens, then I'll just divide that particular video into two different sessions. And I just hope that you would be willing to excuse me on that. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, let's talk Let's go ahead and talk about Passover and what it is. And I'm going to talk about dates and about when at the end. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But Passover is it's a celebration of God's redemption. And for us as Christians, it's going to have two aspects. First of all, it's a celebration of God redeeming his people, Israel, from Egypt, where they had been slaves for 400 years. Well, they had been there for 400 years. They had been slaves for some of that time. Um, but for us as Christians, because of the meaning and the prophecies in Passover, it also symbolizes for us our redemption for, from sin. And you'll see that as we talk about the different elements of Passover more. And um, anyway, so talking specifically about the Jewish aspect of it and the history of it, you're going to read about that in Exodus. You can start at the very beginning of Exodus and the Passover story basically goes through about chapter 14 or 15. And as usual, I'll link it below. I don't have all these references memorized in my mind. I used to, but I'm getting too old now. <laughs> so they're just not there. So anyway, I'll link it below, but just start reading in chapter one and you'll get the story. And it begins with Pharaoh becoming a little bit afraid of these people who are in his land in Egypt, because the children of Israel had come to Egypt when Joseph was there because of a famine. And I'm not going to go into that whole story. But anyway, Israel, who was Jacob, he and his 12 sons and their families all ended up in um, in Egypt. In, in Egypt. <laughs> and at first they were very favored. Uh, Pharaoh honored them. He gave them the choice of land and everything. And so they were really honored. But as it says in, in Exodus and as it says in the Passover Seder, a king rose up who did not know Joseph. And that that king, that Pharaoh, was concerned, and probably, you know, understandably, about these people who were not his people and who were growing greater and greater in numbers. And he was afraid that they might rise up against him and his people. And so he set out to weaken them first and then to annihilate them. And one of the things that he did was he told the midwives to kill any baby boys that were born. Well, the midwives feared God, and so they didn't do that. And so then he told his people, he told the Egyptians to throw any baby boys into the Nile. And, you know, the Nile's full of crocodiles. So you're not, we're not just talking about drowning. So anyway, but before that, he had increased their work as slaves in very unreasonable ways, like not giving them straw to mix with the mud to make bricks and, and things like that. And he was very harsh with them. And, and he tried in that way to weaken them, but it actually made them stronger. So that's when he resorted to killing the baby boys. Well, there was a woman who had a baby that she named Moses. Well, she didn't name him Moses. She had a baby <laughs> and she refused to have him thrown into the Nile. She hid him until he was too big to hide anymore. And then she put him into a little basket that she had made that was waterproof and she put it into the Nile River and had her daughter Miriam watch that basket to see what would happen. That's there's incredible faith there and there's not really time for me to talk about that but moms think about think about what faith that would take to hope that your child will somehow be saved by putting them into a basket in the water with crocodiles around <laughs> and you know just letting it float off and leaving your daughter there to watch well the pharaoh's daughter came and she came with her maids to bathe and she saw this basket floating in the water. And so she took him out. And that's what Moses means is drawn out, taken out of the water. And um, so she decided to keep him as her own son. And we don't really know why, you know, if maybe she just thought, oh, cute baby, I want him for a baby, you know, and 
that kind of thing. Or if it was that she just had a real desire for a child and found this baby and that fulfilled that desire. We don't know, but we know that God orchestrated all of this. He put all of this together and made her come down at just the right place to find Moses and to bring him into her home, the, the, the household of the Pharaoh. Um, there's so much irony in the Bible, isn't there? And, um, Anyway, so she raised him. And one of the providential things that happened at this point when she found him was since Miriam was watching, Miriam came and offered the services of her mother without telling the Pharaoh's daughter that this was her little brother. She offered the services of her mother to nurse baby Moses. So the mother got to have that influence over him for a little bit longer. We don't know if it was a couple of years or months or what, but um, she got to have that influence over him for a little bit longer. So he was raised up in the Pharaoh's home. And there's a lot more that takes place in between all this time. But when he was 40, he saw an Egyptian treating an Israelite slave really badly, and he ended up killing the Egyptian. And so he ran off so that he wouldn't get killed, and he ran to the land of Midian. And while he was there uh, working as a shepherd, he acquired a wife and a father-in-law and all of this, and he was out tending sheep, and he noticed a bush that was burning, and the bush didn't seem to be consumed like a bush would be when it's burning. So he went to check it out. And you probably know the story of the burning bush. God was there. And it was, that was just how God was manifesting himself so that Moses would have something to look at and to relate to. And God told Moses to lead his people out of out of Egypt. And of course, we know that Moses argued about this a little bit. And I mean, he was understandably afraid. There were a lot of reasons for him to not want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> but he finally said, okay, Hineni, I will do it. I'll go. Here I am. Send me. And so he went and with the help of his brother, Aaron, um, he announced to Pharaoh that Pharaoh was supposed to let the Israelites go out into the wilderness to worship God. Of course, Pharaoh said no. And to make a long, long, long story short, Pharaoh says no 10 times. Some of those times he says yes and then changes his mind. One of the interesting things about this passage, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about this here, even though it's a really cool topic to talk about, um, but just something to think about, is that at the beginning you see, you see the Bible saying that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then all of a sudden, at one point, it begins saying the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I just think that that's a cautionary tale. It's something that we need to be aware of, that if we keep hardening our heart against God, eventually he's going to hard it, harden it. He's going to say, OK, fine, that's what you want. Go for it. And this is why it's so important for us to obey God immediately as soon as we know what it is that God wants from us. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to have struggles, but we need to make that commitment that we will do whatever God wants us to do, because ultimately we know that's going to be the best, the best choice, the best plan. Um, it's just a lot of times really hard and really scary. <laughs> <laughs> but as we grow in faith, as we talked about in the um, Memorial Stone series, as we grow in faith, we learn to trust God more and he is able to ask bigger and bigger things of us and we're able to have the faith to be able to do that. So anyway, long story short, 10 times Moses tells Pharaoh to let his people go. 10 times Pharaoh says no. Each of those knows is responded to by God with another plague. Things like all the water turning to blood, frogs completely infesting the land, everybody having boils, um, darkness every place except where the Israelites are, uh, hail, and all kinds of other things. Well, the final thing the final plague that God sent was the angel of death. And he told the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb. So each family was supposed to actually have the lamb come live with them for a few days so that it became kind of like part of their family because this lamb is going to represent them. Sacrifice that lamb 
and paint with the blood of the lamb up on the door, the top of the door and on the lintels and, um, and on the doorposts. And then they're supposed to stay inside and eat the lamb. And they're supposed to eat all of it, not leave any of it. So if their family's too small to eat a whole lamb, they're supposed to have somebody else come join them. And so they do that, and the angel of death passes over. That's where we get the name Passover. The angel of death passes over the homes of the Israelites where the blood is on the doorpost and kills the firstborn of all the Egyptians, including the Pharaoh's firstborn. And so you can imagine at this point, Pharaoh's just kind of going, okay, that's it. I've had enough. And he says, get out of here. Just, just take your people and go. So God, knowing that that was going to happen, told the people that they were not even to let their bread rise. They were just supposed to be ready when they were eating this lamb. They're supposed to have their shoes on their feet, their walking stick in their hands, and they are supposed to be ready to walk out the door and out of Egypt at a moment's notice. The other thing was that they were supposed to go to their Egyptian neighbors and ask for jewelry and other things like this, which is something that we call plundering the Egyptians. And you might hear this sometimes in church in reference to other things, but that's what it's talking about is plundering the Egyptians. And so anyway, so they go out into the wilderness. Um, they cross through the Red Sea, another whole incredible story. Um, and God institutes for them to remember how he delivered them from it, from Egypt. I don't know why I keep saying delivered from Israel. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why he, why he delivered them from Egypt, how he delivered them from Egypt. Um, so he institutes the feast of Passover. And Passover is actually eight days, seven, eight days. Anyway, it's a week. And the Seder, which is what we're going to be talking about, the most important part of the Passover is the first night of Passover. You have to remember, remember in Genesis, in the in the creation story, it says an evening and morning was the first day, an evening and morning was the second day. So the way that we look at days biblically is that it starts in the evening. And so if Passover starts on April 3rd, then it's the night of April 2nd that you have the Seder because that's when Passover begins. And so anyway, so that's the story. And what Passover is all about is, is reliving that in a way. Um, it's, it's the, it has two themes, to remember and to teach. It's to remember what God brought you out of and is to teach it to your children. But one of the interesting things about Passover is that we're commanded to celebrate it as if we ourselves had been brought out of Egypt. So we don't say the Israelites were brought out of Egypt or this happened a long time ago. We say we were brought out of Egypt. We were slaves in Egypt. And so it gives it more of a personal feel and helps you to remember what God has personally brought you out of. It may not have been Egypt exactly, but he's brought you out of something else. And um, whether that's sin in general, but you know, most of us, probably all of us can think of specific things that God redeemed us from, that he brought us out of, that he delivered us from. And that's what Passover is all about. And the symbolism in Passover extends to all those things. It's just really, really beautiful. And so it becomes a very personal thing. And then the other thing besides to remember is to teach. This is something we're supposed to teach to the coming generations because we see in the book of Judges, especially it's just a great example where you see the people really serving God, and, but they don't teach their children. And so then the next generation doesn't really serve God, doesn't really love him and, and want to know him well. And so um, they little by little turn against him. And, and so there's this whole cycle of this happening over and over. And this is what we want to avoid with the celebration of Passover. Okay, now one of the things in Passover is that God tells the people to keep vigil or to watch. And you'll see in Matthew where Jesus 
asks his disciples after the Passover, after they've left, right after the Passover, and they've gone out to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, watch and pray with me. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next video because I'm just about to hit 20 minutes. I'm so sorry that this is so long. But um, we'll talk a little bit more about this and we'll go on to why we should celebrate Passover. All right. I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.